Me, yeah, I'm wearing sunscreen. Why can't you see that? Hi there, I'm John Acorn. I'm a biologist. I'm also a nature nut and I hope you are too. Let's talk about things that some animals see that humans cannot see. The so-called hidden patterns in nature, the secret channels of communication. What can we discern about those? What an interesting question. It, it's fascinating to me. It's fascinating to a number of my students and they're going to help with this video. And, you know, we're interested in how animals interact with their environment and many animals are extremely visual creatures. In other words, they rely on their eyesight to, to guide them through the environment, to find food, uh, to evade predators and, uh, and to find mates and so on and so forth. All right, well, let's, let's assume uh, right now that, that you have a, a basic understanding of how what light is, how it fits into the, the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. Uh, if you don't, I'm going to put a link to a good video in the, uh, in the description for this, uh, for this uh, video, and you can have a look at that first and then come back to this very point. Light is electromagnetic ra radiation, and visible light, what we probably should call human visible light, falls between the red end and the purple end of the spectrum from about uh, 700 to 400 nanometers in wavelength. Roy G. B. is the spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, uh, blue, violet. And that sort of light is very good light for imaging things. It's not a coincidence that we see in the visible spectrum. Visible light reflects the right amount of detail from, uh, from objects in the environment. It doesn't go right through things the way that radio waves do, and it doesn't do um, damage to tissues uh, the way that high energy uh, ultraviolet, the UVB or C, does, or, or you know, not to mention X rays and gamma rays and so on. So we don't want to let that damaging radiation into our eyes, and in fact, our eyes have a lot of uh, uh, UV filtering in the, in the lens of the eye. But I'm getting ahead of myself. My point in, in uh, saying this is that there are probably more similarities between human vision and most animals' visions than there are differences because visible light is good light for imaging. Now, with that as a, as a brief introduction, let's have a look at some different types of, of animal vision and uh, we'll use a little bit of fairly basic uh, video technology to try to imagine what they see as well. Hi there, I'm Zach, and I study butterflies, specifically how they interact with and find their way about in their environment. Now before we talk about invisible light, let's talk about visible light in the simplest terms without any reference to color. So in relatively low light, people, humans, we use uh, our rod cells in our retinas to see achromatically, that's just black and white. Now, while biologists use the term achromatic, we could also use the terms monochromatic or even grayscale. Now, grayscale images make sense to us. I mean, we're able to decipher dark from light, and that's essentially all that we're doing. We're measuring the relative intensity of light as it reflects off objects to navigate our environment, and it works. But the problem is, is that deciphering objects critical to our survival, like flowers and fruits, can be very difficult in grayscale. And so, Many scientists think that this is the reason why humans see color in the first place. Our primate ancestors were lightly frugivores, meaning that they uh, likely ate fruit in the canopies of trees and used color vision to decipher ripening fruit from the background greenery. So in general, whenever an organism sees color, they're likely using that extra sense to decipher objects in their environment that are very integral to their survival. Now, Many butterflies are black and white, but this doesn't mean that they just see in black and white. They see a whole spectrum of colors just like we do. And dogs and other mammals, while they do lack red receptive cone cells 
in their retinas, they do see certain wavelengths of color as they do have blue and green receptive cone cells. So it's not true that dogs just see in black and white, so to speak. Now you can make any image grayscale by just desaturating really any wavelength of visible or invisible light or any combination of wavelengths. Now right now we're using a red filter on the camera which allows only red light to pass through the objective lens onto the camera sensor resulting in fairly high contrast. But let's get further into the electromagnetic spectrum with our friend Laura. Hi, my name is Laura. I like animals in general but especially birds, butterflies and of course bats. So on the electromagnetic spectrum, infrared light actually appears just beyond our red light. So that's at about longer than 700 nanometers in length. Now the cool thing about infrared light is it's actually not heat. So the type of infrared that you might have seen on TV or in movies is actually something that we call mid-infrared or black body radiation. Now the neat thing about black body radiation or mid-infrared is it's actually a little bit longer in wavelength than even our near-infrared light. This means that unfortunately, humans and other animals can't see it with the naked eye. Hi, I'm Sydney and I'm a paleontologist, but I also study wild animals because it helps me understand animals from the past as well. We can of course detect heat ourselves, but some animals like snakes, including pythons and pit vipers, and some insects can detect heat in a specialized way. This is my pet ball python. And as you can see, she has a row of pits along her upper lip. These pits see mid-infrared radiation, which forms sort of a thermal profile of warm-bodied animals nearby. And whether they can see this profile or more feel it is a good question, as is if extinct animals could, like dinosaurs or mosasaurs, which is what I study. Uh, I tend to think that they probably saw in the near ultraviolet range instead of infrared. And here we are in the near infrared, which is a little bit different because our eyes are slightly sensitive to it. The great thing about the near infrared is image captured with near infrared light is a lot more detailed than what we might see otherwise. Now the effect of this is all of the plants and vegetation around us reflect our infrared light and it gives the effect of kind of a horror frosty day in winter. And I think it's just beautiful. Now a lot of fish have really well developed infrared vision and this helps them to see well in shallow murky waters, which is a pretty cool adaptation. Now we use infrared all the time for our wireless remote controls. Here, let me change the channel. No, sorry, wrong button. Let me try again. So here we are in the ultraviolet, ultraviolet light, light with uh, wavelengths beyond the violet, uh, wavelengths below um, uh, 400 nanometers and light that we generally cannot see. Now, this is exciting as a biologist because here is Here's where we should see those classic uh, patterns that you see in the textbooks. The nectar guides on flowers to, to guide bees to the, to the source of nectar and, and pollen. Uh, the hidden patterns on butterfly wings that help butterflies recognize members of their own species. Very, very good. So how, how is this image that you're looking at right now being created? I've got a Sony video camera, I put it on night shot mode, which flips out a little internal filter and makes it more sensitive to both UV and, and infrared. Then I put a, an 18A Tiffin filter on the camera. That blocks almost all the visible light, but allows both the infrared and the UV to pass. Then I put a shot BG40 filter on the camera and that blocks the infrared. So in theory at least, almost everything that is illuminating this image should be ultraviolet light. Cool. So you're thinking, uh, why does it look so normal, John? I mean, the sky is still kind of blue. If there were any clouds, they would be white. The vegetation is an olive greenish kind of color. It just kind of looks washed out without any reds or oranges. Um, in the in the picture but there are good reasons to believe that this is an ultraviolet image or created with ultraviolet light for example my shirt i'm wearing a dark blue shirt 
with dark blue buttons. Dark blue shirt, dark blue buttons. So some of these colors are what we call false colors. The other thing that people do when they, uh, when they demonstrate ultraviolet, everyone does it, is put on sunscreen. So let me put on some sunscreen here. It's a nice sunny day, southern Alberta. I've got some SPF uh, 60 here. And see what that looks like. Put some on my arms. You don't wanna, I'm, I'm a very pale person, so sunscreen is important to me. And as you'll notice, I assume, I'm starting to look a little bit like the vegetation here. It's, uh, it's obviously doing something. Let me, I'll put on a little more than I normally would, just for your entertainment uh, purposes. How's that? Pretty crazy, eh? And uh, that's how sunscreen works. It absorbs the, uh, the energy of the high energy ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light, because it has uh, a shorter wavelength, it's also got a, a higher frequency, it's got more energy, and ultraviolet light has the potential, therefore, to damage tissues, which is why the lenses in our eyes generally filter it out, and why we need sunscreen to prevent our tissues from being damaged. I like the way I look in the ultraviolet. I look kind of tanned. I've never actually been tanned in my entire life. That's not the kind of guy I am. And my hair, my, my increasingly gray hair is a bright and beautiful beacon in the ultraviolet. That doesn't mean that it's a signal to uh, other creatures. It just means that it reflects ultraviolet light. Okay, so I hope I've, con oh, one more thing. I hope I've convinced you that you're actually looking at ultraviolet. I've got an ultraviolet LED flashlight here and it should be very, ooh, it's brighter than anything. Look at that. And I can shine it on my shirt. I see nothing. When I look at my blue shirt, I see no sign of the flashlight beam and you are seeing uh, the flashlight beam very clearly on the yellow shirt. Weird Ola. All right, so to show you how the world might look in black and white or infrared and UV, we use special optical filters and a sensitive sensor on our camera. The thing to keep in mind is even though our camera can create these beautiful images, that doesn't necessarily mean there are any animals alive today that can actually see like this. Special effects are also a lot of fun, like the one you're seeing right now. The other thing to keep in mind is they're even further removed from what animals see in their vision. So even though you might come across special effects titled insect eye or things like that, doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely accurate. So now that we can see uh, an image created from ultraviolet light, uh, what, what, do we, uh, what do we experience? Well, I gotta say, it's been a surprise to me. For one thing, the nectar guides on flowers are a lot more rare than I expected. Very, very few of the flowers that I've looked at have had any nectar guides whatsoever. Dandelions are one example. They're lighter around the outside of the flower and darker in the center. I even went to the University of Alberta Botanic Garden and shot a bunch of, of um, cultivated flowers there and found only, I think, two and one of them was a gentian. Very nice, but you know what I think? I think you don't have to be a genius to find the center of a flower. A flower is a circle. Even a bee can find the center of a circle. It's easy. So it doesn't really surprise me on reflection that we don't see that. What about butterflies? Well, most butterflies look about the same in the ultraviolet as they do in, you know, desaturated uh, visible light. They, they, uh, they don't have surprising patterns. Now, of course, the, the, the really dark parts of butterfly wings are generally dark in the UV and the, and the really 
light parts are generally light, like, you know, the Compton tortoiseshell, nice sort of uh, orange and black butterfly, but it has white spots on the forewings near the leading edge, and those white spots show up very, very clearly. That's obviously, uh, you know, the same pattern in the visible as in the UV. There are a couple of surprises. Um, for example, the cabbage whites. The female cabbage white butterfly, very common butterfly, uh, is very reflective in UV, and so you can see it very easily against the, uh, the more absorptive vegetation background. The male is actually more absorptive, about the same as, as leaves. So that was a surprise. A butterfly like the common wood nymph is, um, is dark brown in the visible and very dark and absorptive in the UV, so it stands out against the vegetation as well. Most interesting butterfly I've, I've uh, uh, photographed or, or videographed so far has been the mariposa copper. Uh, in the visible, it's a kind of you know, it's a nice looking butterfly, but it's brown and gray. There's nothing really exciting about it. In the ultraviolet, the underside of the hind wing, which is gray in the, in the visible, is very brightly reflective in the UV. It's a, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful little thing. Now, is that important to the other members of the species? Well, maybe it is. It makes me think, ooh, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually talk to, communicate with, a creature that can see in the ultraviolet. And you know what? Maybe we can. So this is Sydney Worthy. Sydney is a grad student at the University of Alberta, working with me studying pollinators. And Sydney, you, you realized a long time ago that you see colors a bit differently than other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A long time ago, I saw interesting colors in uh, parrot feathers. So that was the first time I noticed that I might see different colors on other people because they didn't see what I saw. I also saw it in metals and things like that. And I also noticed it in my undergraduate project with you when I was looking at surfeits. Right, so you're looking at these fly specimens and, and you came to me and said, yeah, I think I got these right, but I see them as slightly different colors than what are, what's in the photographs in the key. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then the, the, the thing that really convinced me was the time we were out in the field looking at bees and they're on uh, dandelions and I took a picture of the dandelion with my phone and I said well is this what you see when you look at a dandelion because I know what the ultraviolet uh, photographs of, of dandelions look like and you said no yeah so, so <laughs> tell us yeah. you, you got a dandelion picture that you drew here too so I drew a picture of what I see when I look at a dandelion um, it's, it's not exactly like this, but it's a very bluish green in the center, um, whereas you were seeing yellow. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I just see a more or less uniformly yellow flower. So that's yeah. just so darn interesting. And that, then we then we tried the uh, the eighteen A filter, and I looked. I tried to look through that filter, and I just see really dim red. Mm -hmm. I can barely see through. Mm -hmm. But you saw. What? Um, lots of purples and blues, um, and a lot of things were really reflective purple. Yeah, you yeah. S you you seem to be able to see just about everything. Yeah. Like you're saying, oh yeah, I can see through this filter. Yeah. And then, and then we let Alex, your field assistant, look through the filter, and she saw kind of something in between what yeah. you and I see. Mm -hmm. And she was also able to see the the uh, the infrared remote control, mm -hmm. which you and I couldn't see. Which I couldn't see. So yeah. we're all. Yeah. <laughs> We're all operating in slightly different color spaces, which is so interesting. That, you know, for me, the lesson that I take away from this is that I could not have predicted what you would see from just from my ultraviolet photography. And so you would often see the, these blues or violets in areas that are ultraviolet absorbent, not ultraviolet reflective, mm -hmm. which surprised me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's uh, it's great. I've learned a lot about color vision just from uh, from knowing you. So thank you. So one of the big themes that uh, comes out of visual ecology is that you can't just study animal vision or the appearance of animals, animal coloration in isolation. You have to consider the light environment. Now today, 
in my hometown of Edmonton, the light environment is very peculiar. We woke up to this kind of yellow, orange, rusty look because there's forest fire smoke blowing in from the west, from British Columbia, which has become a kind of uh, typical situation in midsummer uh, here in Alberta. So, uh, so what is the effect of that? Well, the light environment is quite different today than it would be normally. There are very few blue tones uh, apparent. Everything is, as we say, red shifted. The, uh, some of the vegetation looks a little more green, but overall everything is uh, it's not quite the same as a cloudy day. It's kind of an orangey day. Now, if you were, um, if you were another sort of animal, what uh, what would you see? Well, of course, there is still quite a bit of uh, of visual information uh, here in the uh, in the human visible spectrum. But what about the other uh, spectra? Oh well, here in the infrared, we do see a little bit more, I think. Um, and a smoky day in the air is. A little bit like um, the situation in murky shallow water or murky water in general. The, uh, the particulate matter is, is, uh, is shifting things toward the red. So there are indeed fish that, uh, that have a little bit more sensitivity in the near infrared for uh, making their way around in murky shallows. And I don't know, can you see me there um, in the ultraviolet? Very much like a cloudy day, almost no ultraviolet light is getting through all that smoke. So it would not be of any particular adaptive value to have ultraviolet sensitive vision on, uh, on a day like this, in conditions like this, or in murky water. So you know what I find? I find that every time you do something technical, there's always someone who wants to tell you that you did it wrong. You used the wrong equipment or you had the wrong settings or something. And I, before someone tells me that I had the wrong filters, that I should have used the classic industry standard butter U filter, I got to tell you, here's the story. I turned 60 the other day. And for my birthday, I bought myself a Bader U filter. Really good filter. It, uh, it blocks all the visible and all but the tiniest amount of infrared. And it costs a lot of money. But you're now looking at me through the Bader U filter. Does it change my perception of the ultraviolet? Well, not really. I kind of liked my other filter combination because after all, any animal that sees ultraviolet also sees visible light. So mixing the two together in some fashion is a better analog for animal vision than pure UV, which is presumably what you're looking at right now, an image created purely from the UV. Anyway, you know what my advice is. Don't let it bother you. <laughs> Well, what about the built environment, the environment that's created by human beings? Certainly, it must look different than the natural environment to a creature with vision unlike our own. And sure enough, you know, you, you look around in, uh, in the human world and some things are extremely bright in the UV, like this horse, and some things are extremely dark and the amount of contrast is a lot greater than it would be in, uh, in almost any um, natural environment. I don't know of any evidence that that sort of thing is a problem for wild animals, but I think it's, uh, I kind of enjoy this. I haven't been on one of these for a long time. I think that there are other problems. For example, windows. Now windows change the light environment for birds in a terrible way uh, and, and all around the world uncountable numbers of birds are dying because they smack into windows because uh, windows fool them into thinking that they can just fly into 
whatever space they imagine to be behind the window. Um, because windows are partly, you know, transparent, of course, and of course they're reflective as well at other angles. The real problems happen at night. We change the visual environment so much with artificial lighting. Uh, birds, again, you know, sometimes smack into tall buildings with artificial lights on them. Uh, huge numbers of insects waste time flying around light bulbs at night uh, when they should be doing other things. Uh, there, there are lots and lots of, of um, reasons to think that we have influenced the, um, the light environment in negative ways for many organisms at night, but um, less so during the day except for windows. Well, now let's talk about fluorescence. Scorpions, for example, are famous for the fact that they fluoresce. Uh, you aim a, an ultraviolet light at a scorpion and all of a sudden it becomes a wonderful glowing bright greenish or bluish creature. Fantastic. So what's happening there is that, uh, that the surface of that scorpion is absorbing the, uh, some of the energy from the high energy light, the, the UV in this case, but it could also be you know, purple light or blue light, and then re-releasing or releasing that light at a different wavelength as a, as a lower uh, energy light, in this case a green, but it could also be a, you know, a red, a yellow, or orange. And that's fluorescence. Now, scorpions are remarkable in that regard, but fluorescence is actually rather common. Uh, look at green plants. Did you know that the chlorophyll, the green substance inside uh, plant leaves, also fluoresces red, it, it releases red light. You don't see that red because the, uh, the green is masking the red. The green is just so, the green reflections, I should say, are, are so very strong compared to the red fluorescence that you don't see the red fluorescence. It's, it's a lot like the fact that around me, some of the trees now have yellow leaves. Now those yellow pigments were present all through the, the, uh, the growing season, but they've only now become apparent as the chlorophyll is, uh, uh, is lost in the leaves. So the, so the green chlorophyll masks uh, both the, the uh, yellow pigments and the red fluorescence, and, and these thing, things are happening all the time. Um, why do scorpions fluoresce, by the way? Everyone likes to know that. Uh, the, the answer is, we don't know. Uh, it might be good to absorb some potentially damaging uh, high energy radiation, but on the other hand, scorpions don't spend time out wandering during sunlight hours. They're nocturnal creatures, so I can't imagine that's the reason. Anyway, I gotta tell you that, that uh, Fluorescence is, is increasingly obvious to a lot of biologists. It's kind of fun to go out at night with a blue flashlight or a UV flashlight and, and yellow goggles to block all that blue light and, and then see what you can find that's fluorescing. The other day I was given a giant water bug. The staff at the University of Alberta Botanic Garden caught a giant water bug. I put it under the blue light. It fluoresced this wonderful green, not very strong, but very beautiful. And all the water plants around it were fluorescing red. So the world changes a great deal. And, and divers, scuba divers will tell you that the fluorescence they see at night on coral reefs is truly astounding and uh, awe-inspiring. Now let's talk about polarized light. Now, polarization is something separate from wavelength and color, but it still matters because some animals can see polarized light. So let's start with the question, what is polarized light? Well, light is a mysterious thing to begin with, and polarization is mysterious as well. As far as I understand it, and I'm no expert, the deal is this. Whatever light is, when it is whatevering in a wave-like way, and it whatevers in an oscillation with respect to its electronic vector that is in a particular plane, 
with all of the whatever is whatevering in parallel, then it is polarized. When the whatevers are going all different directions, then it's not polarized. And uh, we know a little bit about polarized light in everyday life because of polarized sunglasses or polarizing filters for cameras. Um, I'm using a polarizing filter on this camera right now. It's a blue-yellow polarizer. When, uh, when the polarized reflections, for example, off water are, are reduced, uh, then you get a sort of deep blue color. When the polarized reflections are allowed to pass through the filter, you get a yellow color. Okay, so there are a number of sources of polarized light in nature. One is reflections off, for example, water. Um, the light reflecting off water is polarized in a certain plane, and, uh, and there you go. You also get uh, polarized reflections off, um, this is not so much in nature, but off glass, off automobiles, off road surfaces, and so on. So that's why we have polarizing sunglasses. And when you're a fisherman, you know, you like to have the polarizing glasses so you can look into the water and see the fish more easily. But there are also polarizing patterns, or polarized patterns, uh, that are caused by the scatter in certain sorts of media, including the sky. So there's a polarized pattern in the sky. Many animals use that pattern in the sky to, uh, to orient themselves, to navigate. And the same is true under water. There's a polarized pattern that occurs because of scatter under water. And, uh, and many fish make use of that. We can, uh, we can recreate those patterns by using uh, a fairly simple technique, at least simple now. Uh, you, you take one image or one video uh, with the polarizing filter at, at, you know, a particular angle, and then you take another image at uh, a right angle to that, and then you combine those images, you blend them using what's called a difference mode, and, uh, and those um, pixels that show a great difference will be brighter than those that don't, and usually there's a kind of a color spectrum, and so we can recreate polarizing pattern or polarized patterns uh, photographically. It's very interesting as well that some uh, organisms have polarized patterns on themselves to communicate with, uh, with other things that can see polarized light, and lots and lots of animals can see polarized light. Uh, some butterfly wings have polarized patterns on them. Some uh, beetle exoskeletons have uh, polarized patterns. Some uh, fish and mantis shrimp and so on and so forth. It's really quite a wonderful subject. So there you go, that's polarized light. Yet another aspect of light and another aspect that we as people generally cannot see, although I'm sure there's someone who's going to say, no, no, John, under just the right conditions, some people at least can see some polarized patterns. Yeah, that's true, but for the most part, we leave it to the other critters. Okay, so what's the bottom line? Well, to me, the bottom line is, on the one hand, don't overestimate these so-called hidden uh, signals, messages, patterns in nature. On the other hand, don't underestimate them either. They do exist and many animals can see um, in ways that we cannot. So it is a real subject. But it's always difficult to think about the invisible, isn't it? Because we're continually told that invisible things are very, very important. Invisible uh, radiation, invisible chemicals, invisible toxins, invisible germs, uh, invisible spirits, demons, ghosts and deities, uh, not to mention hidden agendas, hidden motives, and so on and so forth. And some of those things are real, but others are not. And you've got to be very careful in your thinking when you deal with the invisible, especially when someone is trying to sell you something invisible. It may not exist. Not that all invisible products are nothing, but some are. Yeah.
anyway uh hope you enjoyed the uh the video and if, especially if you're a biologist do look into all the wonderful details of subjects such as uh visual physiology um, the evolution of uh, of animal vision uh, visual ecology a new and and emerging uh, discipline it's all great it's all wonderful and this is just a, uh, a super brief fun introduction to that uh, tremendous subject. Hope you enjoy. See you later.